So UFC 296 just happened and I would say it was a pretty good card. The prelims and early prelims were very good. The main card was good. There were a few lackluster fights on it, but overall it was a good card. Lots of finishes like Josh Emmett's knockout of Bryce Mitchell, which we'll talk about more in a minute, or Cody Garbrandt's knockout of Brian Kelleher. Real quick before we get into the fights, not only in the cage, but also in the stands, uh, do you guys want me to talk about the main event first and then go? to the prelims sort of work my way down like I typically do or would you rather me start with the early prelims and work my way up to the main event I do it main event to prelims first because I think it increases retention but tell me in the comments down below which one you would prefer and I'll do that from now on but the first fight we're going to talk about did not take place inside of the octagon it took place in the stands between Sean Strickland and Drickus Duplessis in the post fight press conference Dana himself admitted that he does a seating chart for every single event Event, and he himself put Drickus next to Sean. I mean, Drickus was only two rows back from Sean, and the shit they were talking to each other in the press conference the day before, I don't know why Dana thought it would be a good idea. There's no way it was an accident, so he had to have done it on purpose, probably was trying to create some viral moment, and he did, and that'll probably help build the fight. They'll use it in the promotional videos. I'm still trying to figure out exactly how this fight started, because to my best knowledge, Drickus was challenging Sean to a fight right there there in the stands. That's at least what Gilbert Burns' wife said, and I've also heard that Drickus said something to Sean, and Sean got upset. But we actually have some footage of the fight, so let's break this down. So to the best of my knowledge, Drickus challenged Sean to a fight, and Sean asked Gilbert Burns' kid to move. So good guy Sean asked Gilbert Burns' kid to move so he didn't just plow right through him and kill him. And then Sean jumps over the seats and starts attacking Drickus, starts landing elbows to the back of the head. They start punching each other. It looks like Drakus goes in for a double leg or something. And then it actually almost looks like Sean gets dropped. Now he probably just slipped or tripped on a chair or something, but it looks like he falls to the ground and then security steps in. Dana White himself had to step in and tell them to stop and break up the fight. Dana White's like the peacekeeper of the UFC. It seems every single time someone gets into a fight and Dana's there, he's able to calm down the situation like Uncle Aya versus Johnny Walker, a few months back and then whenever Dana's not there all hell just breaks loose like Daniel Cormier versus John Jones or Michael Chiesa versus Kevin Holland not sure exactly why they fought or why Dana thought it would be a good idea to sit them next to each other but it created a viral moment that'll help build the fight so maybe the UFC won in the end but let's talk about the main event Leon Edwards wins a unanimous decision against Colby Covington dominated him from start to finish pretty much only lost one round and it was a pretty lackluster performance overall from both guys. There wasn't a whole lot of action. Now, Leon didn't have to do a lot to win because Colby wasn't doing much himself. And a lot of the time, that's how Leon fights. He does just enough to win the rounds. And that's pretty much what he did here. He clearly won rounds one through four. Now, they weren't overly dominant, but Leon clearly won them. And then Colby clearly won the fifth round. And he only really won that round because Leon tried to reverse the takedown, tried to go offensive instead of getting to the underhooks, working up from the bottom like he did in the third round, I think it was. Instead of trying to force a scramble, use the cage, get back up to his feet, he tried to threaten with a triangle choke, which was nowhere close to being completed because they were all sweaty, and Colby's way too good of a grappler to get caught in something like that. But overall, Colby didn't look too great. He looked hesitant on the feet. It looked like the ring rust had gotten to him. He hadn't fought in almost two years, I think. I think his last fight was in February of 22 and it's almost 2024. He's also getting up there in age. He's 35 years old now, which is old for a welterweight. Nearing the end of his prime, combined with the long layoff, combined with his hesitancy, he definitely seemed afraid of Leon's power on the feet, which is unlike him. He got knocked down multiple times against Kamaru Usman, got knocked down against Jorge Masvidal, who all probably hit harder than Leon, and Colby still walked forward, but against Leon, he was way too hesitant, stayed on the back foot for most of this fight and some of the success he did have came when he started pressuring Leon. Colby was never going to win off the back foot. I said 
in my prediction video, whoever pressured the other one was going to be the one who won. And Leon was the one that pressured Colby for 90% of this fight, and he won that 90%, and the 10% Colby pressured him, Colby won. But overall, it was a good performance from Leon. The leg kicks were a huge weapon. He kept kicking at Colby, moving forward, and then when Colby would try and blitz forward, he would look to counter him with the left hook. Leon defended a ton of the takedowns. Colby only went 2 for 10 on his takedown attempts. Leon himself went 2 for 3. Leon was able to take Colby down, which is insane. He was able to take Colby down. He was able to take Usman down. He was able to defend a lot of Colby's takedowns, so if his takedown defense keeps improving at this rate, there's maybe no one that could beat him. He's arguably the best striker in the division. It's between him and Wonderboy, in my opinion, and if he can defend the takedowns from, like, a Shavkat, which is still a big if, then he might just be everyone. But as for who's next for both guys, I think it's pretty clear Leon should fight Bilal. Bilal's been deserving of a title shot. He's by far the most deserving of the next title shot, even more than Shavkat, who I see being thrown around a little bit. I still think Shavkat needs one more fight. And then as for Colby, I think he himself should fight Shavkat. I think that makes the most sense, but he probably won't fight him. It looked like he didn't want to fight him in his post-fight press conference. He called out Wonderboy, which makes a lot of sense for Colby, but not a lot of sense for anyone else. So I think he should fight Shavkat. If he won't fight Shavkat, then maybe he should fight the winner of Gilbert Burns, Jack Della Maddalena. If he won't fight them, then I just don't know. Then we go to Alejandre Pantoja defending his belt for the first time against Brandon Royval, winning a unanimous decision. And both guys look pretty good. Royval looked very good. Definitely improved a lot since their first fight with each other. His striking looked better. His grappling looked a lot better. But the big difference between them two was the wrestling. Pantoja was just a much better wrestler. He was able to take Royval down. Royval's takedown defense didn't look too great. And Royval had a hard time taking Pantoja down. Down. Now Pantoja was the better grappler, so he's winning the grappling scenarios. But Royval did look very good with his grappling. He was able to defend a lot of the submission attempts. Now Pantoja didn't attempt too many, but he was able to defend positions very well. On the feet, the body shots from Pantoja were a huge weapon. He was landing very good body kicks. But Pantoja's cardio didn't look too good. He started to gas out in like the fourth and fifth rounds, and Royval started to take over in the fourth and fifth rounds. Not necessarily win, but Royval Royval arguably looked like he had better cardio despite not having the five round experience that Pantoja has and not working the body as much as Pantoja did so Royval's cardio did impress me a lot. And then on the feet Pantoja did have a clear advantage. He had a amazing chin, was very hard for Royval to hurt. He might have the best chin in the flyweight division. He has never been knocked out once. He has been against some of the hardest hitting guys. Brandon Moreno hit him hard so many times. He fought Davidson Figueroa who was the hardest hitting guy in flyweight division history and Pantoja still didn't go down. He got dropped once but he didn't get knocked out and then Royval got hurt a couple times. Pantoja hits really hard. He has very underrated power but he was able to take the shots decently. He did get hurt a few times but he kept recovering and overall he didn't look too bad but Pantoja was just better. He might be the best fighter at flyweight. As for who I want to see him fight next, I think it should be Amir Albazi but Al Bazi is fighting Brandon Moreno, so I guess you do who the winner of that fight versus Pantoja. And then as for Brandon Royval, I would like to see him versus Manel Kemp if he gets past Mateus Nikolaou or possibly Mohamed Mokaev. I know it is a big step up in competition for Mokaev. I know it is a big jump in the rankings, but he's undefeated. I think he's ready, and honestly, everyone else has a fight booked, and I don't think anyone else makes much sense. Then we go to Shavkat Rachmanov becoming the first guy to submit Steven Wonderboy Thompson in the second round. Wonderboy really impressed me with his takedown defense here. He was able to defend all the takedowns in the first round, was able to defend himself in the clinch. You can clearly tell the entire focus of this camp was takedown defense, which it should have been going against Shavkat, who was definitely going to look to wrestle. Now, after Shavkat said he came into the fight with a serious ankle injury that needed surgery but he decided to wait until after the fight so he could still fight wonder boy which if that's true that would explain why he was having a harder time taking wonder boy down because he didn't have the same drive on his takedowns but at the same time how would he be able to pass medicals i know the ufc doctors suck michael bisping was able to fight with one eye but still you would think if it's that serious of an injury there was no way it would be able to slip by medicals there's no way he would have been able to pass and been able to fight so i don't know i don't i'm not saying i don't believe 
believe him. I do believe him. But the UFC doctors are so incompetent at times. And then in the second round, Shavkat was finally able to take Wonderboy down, got to his back, and got the rear naked choke, and became the first person to submit Steven Thompson. Which is crazy, because this guy has gone up against so many good wrestlers and grapplers, and none of them have been able to submit him, but Shavkat was the one who finally could. Which shows just how good Shavkat is, and he really just didn't give Wonderboy any room to breathe. He was constantly attempting takedowns, threatening with takedowns, holding him against the fence in the clinch, not allowing Wonderboy to get at range and Wonderboy really couldn't get much offense off because he was just constantly defending the takedowns and then his takedown defense did look good but Shavkat just needed the one and the second this fight touched the ground it was over like I said in my prediction video so good performance from Shavkat like I said I think you should fight Colby next if Colby just completely refuses to fight him then maybe you do him versus Usman still don't know what's going on with Usman he wants to fight at middleweight I, I don't know but if Usman is coming back down to welterweight I'd like to see him versus Shavkat and and then we go to Patty Pimblett winning a unanimous decision over Tony Ferguson. It's time for Tony to retire. He looked terrible in this fight. He looked slow. He looked old. He wasn't listening to his corner's advice. In the third round when Patty started to gas out and Tony started catching him on the feet, having success. We all know Tony still has power and Patty striking defense is terrible to say the least. But Patty was able to take this fight to the ground and Tony showed no urgency to get up. His corner was even telling him, you need to get up, Tony. We need to go now. And he just laid there. He didn't even attempt to get up. He didn't try and force a scramble or use the cage to get up, try and push off nothing. He just stayed on his back, attempted a few half-assed submissions here and there, and lost the fight. And even when he was in his corner, he looked completely out of it. Didn't look like he wanted to be there. Didn't even look like he cared at all. The whole David Goggins in the corner trying to hype him up. Come on, Tony. You got this, Tony. Just like we trained Tony. Like, like, what are you doing? He was asked in the press conference why he brought David Goggins in, and he said, I am not going to answer that question. It's private. And if I had to guess, I would put a lot of money on it. It's because he's just not motivated and doesn't want to fight anymore. And of course, he's not going to say that before the fight to his opponent with Patty right there. But he just didn't seem like he wanted to fight. He was having some success on the feet. He was catching Patty. Patty said he spent a lot of his training camp working on his striking defense. Didn't show one bit. He would still blitz into range with his chin up and his hands right at his hips. And because of that, Tony was able to catch him quite a bit, especially in the early round. But Patty was just hitting Tony more, and the difference in chins, the difference in youth really showed here. Patty's like 12 years younger than Tony, and it showed in their chin. Patty was able to take Tony's shots pretty well, and Tony was not able to take Patty's shots at all. Anytime Patty would throw a right hand, a left hand didn't matter. Tony would look away from the punch, and he was flinching. He seemed hesitant and afraid of Patty, which is very uncharacteristic of Tony. Patty was even able to drop Tony at one time and he hurt him I think more than once. So yeah it's time for Tony to retire. His chin is shot. He doesn't seem like he wants to do it anymore. He's so slow and old. He's like 39 but looks 55 so I think it's time to call it a career. As for Patty I think you have to give him a ranked fighter at this point. I would like to see him versus Drew Dober. That fight was rumored a few months ago but I'm still not very impressed with Patty. His grappling is very good. He was able to out grapple Tony. Tony had a lot of success in the grappling, but his wrestling still isn't great. His offensive striking is good, but his defensive striking is terrible. And honestly, looking at the lightweight rankings, I don't know if he beats a single one of these guys. Maybe Bobby Green, if that Jalen Turner knockout really affected his chin. But Patty has a long way to go before he's some championship caliber fighter, and I just think he's too old at this point. People forget. Some people think Patty's like 24, 25. He's 28. He's not young. He's nearing his prime, and if this is his prime and he's not a bad fighter he'll beat a lot of the guys who aren't ranked but he's not some champion that a lot of people thought he would be and then we go to josh emmett knocking bryce mitchell out cold one of the most disturbing knockouts i've ever seen i know some people are saying this is the most disturbed they've ever been from a knockout this is the worst knockout they've ever seen and honestly it's up there for me the only one i would confidently put above this is michael chandler's knockout of tony ferguson and maybe francis's knockout 
of Stipe, but the Chandler vs. Tony knockout is the only time I have ever thought someone died in the octagon. Watching that fight live, seeing Mike front kick Tony, and then Tony just fall flat on his face and lie there motionless for like five minutes. He kept laying there, he wasn't moving. It's the only time when watching a fight and seeing a knockout I thought someone died. I genuinely thought Tony might have just died right there. But it was an amazing performance from Josh Emmett. He might be the hardest hitting 145er ever. Actually, now that I think about it, I don't think there's ever been a featherweight who hits harder than Josh Emmett, even at his older age, 38 years old and still looks good. Lead Leading up to this fight, I went back and rewatched Bryce Mitchell's fight with Dan Ige, and Ige kept continuously catching Mitchell. And I thought if Ige can catch Mitchell, Josh Emmett can absolutely catch him, and Josh Emmett hits way harder than Dan Ige. And Bryce Mitchell's coming in on short notice. He had a full training camp against Dan Ige. So it kind of surprised me that Mitchell was a favorite. I think that was based solely on the fact that Yair Rodriguez submitted Josh Emmett. But there's context behind everything. Ilya Taporia, who is a much better grappler than Bryce Mitchell, we saw the clear grappling difference between them two in their fight, couldn't submit Josh Emmett, and had a hard time taking him down. And Ilya is a much better wrestler than Mitchell. But it was a very good performance against Josh Emmett. Mitchell didn't attempt a single takedown I don't think which I don't really understand but Emmett was just able to line up that right hand as Mitchell moved into it and it landed perfectly right on the chin and then after Mitchell started seizing and like convulsing it was very scary stuff hopefully he's okay hopefully he can recover he's still a young guy but he needs to take a long time off and come back in maybe late next year then let's talk about some of these prelims. I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm not going to be able to go in detail about all of them. Dustin Jacoby vs. Alonzo Menafield was a cool fight. I remember in the third round seeing the live odds, and Jacoby was like a minus 450 favorite, and thinking it might be good to put some money on... Uh Alonzo Menafield. And Menafield did come back, did win the fight. He won the first round, won the third round. Jacoby won the second round. It's interesting because Jacoby should not be getting outstruck by Menafield, but Menafield was outstriking him at times. Jacoby doesn't have the best striking defense. He's very good offensively, but defensively, especially with his boxing defense, he gets hit. You would think a glory kickboxer would have better kickboxing defense, but nope. It was a good performance from Menafield overall. Jacoby looked all right, I guess definitely needs to improve in some areas. Irene Aldana versus Carol Rosa was an insane fight. Probably the best women's fight I've seen all year. It was an absolute war between them two where Aldana was getting the better of the boxing exchanges and Rosa was getting the better of the kicking exchanges. The leg kicks were a huge weapon for Carol Rosa. The way Irene Aldana stands, she stands like a boxer. She fights pretty much solely like a boxer, which means she puts a lot of weight on that lead leg, which makes her extremely vulnerable to the leg kicks and the leg kicks were the biggest weapon Rosa was destroying that lead leg and Aldana can't really switch stances but the inside leg kicks the outside leg kicks all of it were a huge weapon for Rosa dominated the first round and then in the second round Aldana began to get in start working on her boxing was pressuring Carol Rosa back which made those leg kicks less effective and started piecing her up with the boxing Aldana might be the best boxer in the bantamweight division women's bantamweight division and Rosa isn't a great boxer those straight shots down the center line the jabs the one twos the right straights for Aldana were a huge weapon and Rosa's offensive boxing isn't great she was slapping with a lot of her hooks she was throwing weird awkward punches in range that Aldana was able to pick out and counter and then when Rosa got in a bit of trouble she tried to shoot in a takedown and Irina Aldana was able to easily defend it so good work from her and great work from both of these girls definitely fight of the night they definitely both deserve a bonus here Aldana landed 204 significant strikes in three rounds in five rounds against Amanda Nunes she threw 118 she was so gun shy she was so scared of the power coming back at her I think the moment also got to her being the main event in a championship fight against the greatest female fighter of all time, but she made the adjustment. Her volume was insane. Her cardio looked great, and I'm excited to see what she does next. I would like to see her beat up Juliana Pena, and then if she beats Juliana, which I think she would, I would like to see her versus the winner of Bueno Silva and... 
Raquel Pennington. I forgot who was fighting there for a minute. Cody Garbrandt knocks out Brian Kelleher in the very first round. Cody looked very good. He wasn't as gun shy as he was against Trevin Jones. I think all those knockouts he had taken from Kaikara Franz and TJ Dillashaw made him a little hesitant in the Trevin Jones fight to really go for, but he looked good here. His footwork looked very good. He was super fast, very powerful. His technique on his strikings looked all right. Not as good as it has in some of his past fights like against Dominic Cruz but he's also getting a bit older it seemed like he wanted to make a statement and a statement he made Kelleher is a very hard guy to knock out he'd only been knocked out once before this I believe and he has faced some guys who hit really hard and Cody was able to beat him in a striking match the speed advantage was clear Cody might still be the fastest guy at 135 he's definitely up there as for who I would like to see him fight next let's check out the bantamweight rankings it's like he's climbing up the rankings all over again. I would like to see him fight someone lower in the rankings, maybe a Chris Gutierrez or a Ricky Simone possibly, because Umar is definitely going to be looking up. Jonathan Martinez is definitely going to be looking up. He already fought Pedro Munoz. I would also really like to see him versus Dominic Cruz at some point. The bad blood between them two. Cruz is getting older, but so is Cody. Before they both retire, I would love to see them face each other one last time because of the history between them two. Ariana Lipsky beat Casey O'Neill. I am officially off the Casey O'Neill train. She did not look very good here. Got submitted in the second round from an arm bar. Yeah, I don't know what it is with Casey O'Neill. She was getting pieced up on the feet, got taken down, and got submitted. So, I don't know what's next for her. But good performance from Ariana Lipsky. Tagir Ulanbekov submits Cody Durden in the second round with a rear naked choke. I write notes on all these fights, and my only note here is Tagir is ginormous. This man is so big for flyweight. I had to check. I saw at the bottom it said flyweight division. I had to check and make sure this wasn't a featherweight fighting. Because this guy is huge. He looks like a bantamweight or a featherweight. He might be the biggest guy at flyweight. But overall, it was a great performance from Tagir. He did get a knockdown, I think, in the second round. But Cody was hitting him a little bit, so that does worry me for some of the higher-end guys in this division. But then he was able to use the wrestling and really use his grappling. He attempted so many submissions here and got the choke in the second round. So good performance from him. His wrestling, his grappling looked very good. He's very powerful in the striking. I mean, he's huge, so of course he's going to have some power. But he looked very good here. And then we go to one of my favorite unranked fighters, my favorite hardcore band singer, Andre Feely knocks out Lucas Almeida in the first round. Looked amazing here. Great performance from Andre Feely. Knocked him out with a huge right hand only like two minutes into the fight. Okay, three minutes into the fight. And then in the post-fight press conference, he talked about some of the stuff going on in his life. So, I hope he's doing good. Hope he gets better. He should have got a bonus. I don't think he did though, so that that's unfortunate. Come on, Dana. Give that man 50k cheap ass. And then finally, Shamil Gassiev knocks out Martin Boudet. He looked pretty good, just sort of overwhelmed Boudet with his power, with his sheer volume of strikes. Boudet only landed eight total strikes. That is crazy. Landed one strike in the second round, seven in the first. And I'm very excited to see where Shamil Gassiev goes from here. I think this was his UFC debut. No, it was his second UFC fight. He's finished both of his fights. I think he only has one decision on his record in total, so very interesting to see where this guy goes in the heavyweight division. But anyways, that is the end of the video. This card was pretty good. Now we gotta wait a whole month for the next fights, but don't go anywhere because I have some very good videos planned out. I'm going to do my predictions for next weekend's boxing card. I'm going to do some predictions for the upcoming fights that were just announced. Talk about Michael Venom Page joining the UFC. I'm going to do my pound for pound rankings because I think the UFC's pound for pound rankings suck. I'm going to predict who I think will be champion to end 2024. There's a lot of good content coming, so subscribe so you don't miss it. Like the video if you didn't enjoy. Leave your opinions in the comments down below. Also, make sure to turn on that bell. Click post notifications so you don't miss uploads. Make sure it says all not personalized. What the f*** does that even mean? How does YouTube know exactly which ones you want? So make sure you click all. If you want to, you don't have to subscribe, but I do appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in the next video, probably coming out on Wednesday. Also, go watch my last video on Colby Covington versus Leon Edwards and why Colby is an embarrassment to the UFC. Thank you, guys. Bye. Love you.